Hello, hello. It's your host, Kim Clark of the podcast, Communicate Like You Give a Damn. And today's guest is knows this very, very well, and she's very uh, legal about it. So, <laughs> so I'm going to let I'm going to let her, I'm just going to hand it over to her and have her introduce herself because she has a really impressive bio. She is a leader in communications in the Canadian government. And to access this kind of expertise, I really need you to just be close to the speaker and push in your headphones a little bit more because there's going to be a lot of goodness that comes out of this. And I can already predict then we're not going to get to everything that we ought to get to. So there'll be a part two. But, well, S.A., I know that's your nickname, but introduce yourselves to our listeners, please. Hi, Kim. Super great to be here. Joining you, as you said, north of the 49th parallel. I'm here in what we call the nation's capital, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, I am a transplanted northwestern Ontario girl. Um, and I've been working for the government as a public servant, so not on the political side, on what we call the, um, the bureaucratic side, um, for over 25 years now. I did not start when I was 12, unfortunately. <laughs> started, started almost midway in my career. Um, so a little bit about me. Before I got here, I worked for Planned Parenthood here in Canada. I ran a theater program. Um, I worked for a symphony orchestra and arts administration, uh, ran programs for youth and outreach programs there, as well as what we call putting bums in seats. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I joined the federal public service after I did my graduate work in, of course, what is a part of my everyday feminist cultural politics. <laughs> um, but I've always, always been really, really interested in how women at early on are represented in media in the public sphere um that's sort of what i centered my research on and uh then in my work i've worked at a place called parks canada i spent the bulk of my career um working in communications at the former um indigenous and northern affairs canada um that's the department for those of you who are familiar with any of Indigenous history in Canada, colonial history in Canada, um, is the, the part of government here in Canada that administers something called the Indian Act. Um, so manages people on reserve, uh, a long history. That act is over 100, over 100 years old, so you can imagine. It's the long, the long arm of colonialism. Um, but I spent 18 years there in communications, and then the last six and a bit, I've been what we call the head of communications here at Justice Canada. And at Justice, we do a couple of different things. One, we're the government's law firm. So we represent, my colleagues go to court and represent the government when they're getting sued, um, or in the government's interest when we're doing the same for anybody, any department in, in the federal government. But then the other part of us is um, fulfilling the mandate of the Minister of Justice, which has to do with the criminal code, with family law, um, with uh, youth justice, um, or youth criminal code, you know, is another name for it, the not as friendly. But also we play a big role in decolonizing Canada's laws. And uh, my department and um, my folks work on... Um, implementing the United Nations um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People here in Canada. We are the first member state who signed on to that declaration at the UN um, to enact legislation um, to implement and hold the government to account for as long as that legislation is in place um, to implement the declaration here in Canada. So um, in many ways, we... Like under the criminal code in Canada, that is everything from medical assistance in dying, because it is under certain circumstances legal here in Canada. Um, it has to do with um, bail conditions, uh, what people are convicted of, how long they're incarcerated. And what's been really interesting over the past six years is a real effort 
to, um, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, I would say it was spurred by uh, the death of George Floyd. We couldn't hide anymore. We'll call it the murder of George Floyd. Call it for what it is. Thank you. But we really needed to all look inward um, and an acknowledgement that our criminal justice system here in Canada was disproportionately incarcerating Indigenous and Black people um, here in Canada. So we're everybody thinks we're friendly. We got all the same sort of issues of colonialism and racism. They may play out slightly differently, um, but uh, I've been really doing that kind of work here, really about reaching out to some of Canada's most vulnerable, um, whether they're looking at medical assistance in dying um, or whether we're trying to ensure that the policies that we put in place here um, don't further discriminate against Indigenous people and Black people, especially in the criminal justice system. Um, and then a lot around victim, victims' rights too. So it's been yeah. some... There's been some really interesting stuff we've been working on, and my communications branch supports all of that. Um, we help tell Canadians what we're doing and why. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's pretty exciting. I think it's pretty exciting work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. <laughs> and you have such a unique background to bring to this role. I love your mug, by the way. Um, you, that's, that's my nickname for the team. <laughs> I love it so much. I'm not the only one with a mug. <laughs> uh and what that your background and what you do and what you're passionate about is something that you encapsulated by contributing uh an article to our book the conscious communicator the fine art i'm not saying stupid shit and yeah it, we don't like stupid shit <laughs> You, your article is so moving and it, it hits at, at so many different angles. It's at the end of chapter four, where we have just introduced the depth model and the D, deliberate, being deliberate in our communication, specifically around diversity, equity and inclusion communications mm -hmm. and social justice communications. So when I was writing the book, I immediately thought of you uh, and, and thank you for your generosity in contributing this article. It's called Compassion, Curiosity, Empathy, and Action, Ensuring Our Communications Efforts Respect Vulnerable Audiences. So yeah. tell me about what you were talking about in this article and what you hope communicators will take away from it. Yeah, well, I've spent years in this type of work realizing that um, – Government communications channels um, often aren't very trusted. So, um, and I, we can understand why, right? Government doesn't have, for the past, you know, previous to the last maybe five to ten years, didn't do a great job of listening, right? Kind of deciding, like, father's knows best approach to things. Um, and I think since... And I, you and I have talked about this before. I realized when I got my first director position, where I had control over a budget, um, where I could determine the type of hiring that we did and why, when I could um, take risks that maybe my colleagues in policy or program areas might not have been willing to take, um, that I could use my powers for good. Um, and so it has taken a lot of learning, but I would say that my, I'll start with my overall goal is that I want to create things that make lasting change, right? I've been at this for 25 years in government. I want to build things that matter and I want to build things that make a difference. So for me, that's two pronged. It's not just what we do, it's who does it and how we do it. So, um, you know, I talk about in that chapter, you know, so many people think government is just so bureaucratic and so technocratic and that we hide behind policies. But my approach, it's with my staff, it's with my colleagues, is we've got to use policies as swords, not as shields to hide behind. And Different things have motivated me over. You like that one, I know that. I do. Um, I do. The, 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 just, just, it's also very visual. 
Right. Yeah. Well, and then I just think of Wonder Woman too, and it's just like <laughs> ping, 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 ping. Anyways, that's okay. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm not wearing that outfit though. Um, but the I'll take the little metal, the Defender things. Yeah, that was my um, favorite when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, actually, I used to dress up like Catwoman a lot. But the, we'll digress. Maybe, maybe in the next podcast, we we'll can, talk we can about dive that. Into that little bit a little bit more, yeah. but. But more importantly, I've been trying as soon as I was able to build things that matter and build things that include those um, people who maybe don't look like me, don't have my experiences, um, who are on the margins, right, of the work that we do. So spending 18 years at indigenous affairs taught that to me like it was in my face with my staff with our partners um we have a um a concept in when we're doing work with indigenous partners it's called the honor of the crown and you know we are as a public servant and i learned then that i was there representing the government, which for decades was the Indian agent, for decades could have been the RCMP officer who took your children away, um, the Indian agent who made you move into a smaller, um, less hospitable home, um, you know, the, the generational trauma that had been created. And I had to learn really quickly that I carried that history with me and that if I wanted to put a different face on it, I needed to behave differently and I needed to tell them how I, and I needed to acknowledge those truths. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that through my colleagues, Indigenous colleagues calling me out on it. I learned it so much through the work that I was able to have exposure to um, when the government did an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls mm -hmm. um, and um, two-spirited individuals. The power of being in the room with families of missing sisters and loved ones um, and listening to their stories. But even sometimes, like Kim, you and I have talked about this, just my colleagues, my Indigenous colleagues recognizing that their father survived residential school, right? So it put my privilege in perspective. Um, which was hard at first. It's a hard lesson because I grew up, I'm second generation Canadian. My parents, my dad had grade eight. My mom had to finish school in grade 10 to help pay the bills, but she had a single mom. I never really thought that I had anything special. I've always, we talked, ooh, elbows up. I've been elbows up um, since I was in grade school. And, um, and then all of a sudden I'm in these positions where People just look at me and I am a director general of communications. I am a representative of the government and um, I needed to do better, right? I needed to do better and I, something I tell my staff, we need to show our work. Do not make assumptions that people believe that the way that you got here or the reason you're there are good, right? Because it's not about me as a person, it's about us uh, doing this work together and doing it differently. So can I, can I dive yeah. in a little bit on that? That, sh that we must show our work. Here you are, the head of communications. And I get this pushback from clients sometimes. It's like, well, I can't control what the other departments do. You know, I can only talk. It, it's just, I'm just writing about what happened. And I'm saying visibility drives accountability. I'm saying that language leads to behavior. And that there is a relationship there. And it's based on a relationship that you have with your partners, of course. Yeah. However, talk more about how you do that. How do you show your work as a com in communications? In communications. Um, so there's another phrase we have in government, which is um, fearless advice and loyal implementation. So I am not the decision maker, right? There are politicians who are democratically elected to make decisions on behalf of Canadians. And that's my minister who's elected. It's the cabinet of ministers who make the large decisions for government. And we take their direction. But I have every opportunity to influence 
um, the way that we communicate those policy ideas. And so um, I speak truth to power. Um, so I, sh so that's the harder work to show, but let me give you an example of, of something that we that we did. And sometimes concrete is the best. So with the United Nations Declaration um, on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, we, I was able to get funding through this sort of policy ask. You always try, you always, government, you always got to try and get the funds to fund what you're doing. And I was able to get funding for people and, and things, as I call them, um, to support the communications on that. And for us to do things differently, I needed to work with Indigenous organizations. I needed to show them the work we were doing. So one example was we, um, we put together a youth advisory committee of First Nations Inuit and Métis youth from across Canada to give us advice and to help us develop a video to talk about what does the UN Declaration mean to me. To be honest, Kim, I didn't think it was going to be an Academy Award nominee piece. What really mattered to me was about showing these young people that we were willing, first of all, to pay them. I'm not going to just ask them to volunteer their time Excellent. and their and their expertise. So they all got an honoraria. They were guided by elders, Inuit, uh, First Nation, and Métis elders at every session. We hired um, an Indigenous producer um, and a uh, music producer because they wanted original music. And the facilitator wasn't one of my team members. I had an Indigenous facilitator work with them. We were there to guide. And so when you look at this video, um, it doesn't look like government touched it at all, right? Um, because they're holding the cameras. They're running it. And we take time to explain on the website how we produced it. We'll be... Um, this spring um, doing our first action plan on the implementation of the UN Declaration here in Canada. And I can't control all of the um, actions that are gonna be committed to by government, but I can help influence the way we tell Canadians and Indigenous people about it. So again, that's gonna be an Indigenous designer who's gonna work with a broad range of Indigenous artists, but in the past, we would kind of like just put that up on the web and, you know, put the Canada word mark, our copyright on it. But this time I'm like, no, we need to explain how we did this in the spirit of the declaration. So our plan is to have an annex that talks about the production of this document. How did we do it? Who did we consult with? Who were the artists that contributed to it? Where do they come from? What are the stories they want to tell? And again, they all have to be like compensated appropriately. I have to be careful with with um, that sort of indigenous copyright issues as well. Like I have certain copyrights, but trying to be really respectful. Um, so it goes that work goes right down to the contracts that we put in place, to the beautiful thing that ends up going up on our website or being printed off in a First Nation community. So um, it matters how you do it, not just what you do it, what you do. And, and so that's, I, I hope that explains how I show my work, show my work. I also show my work to my staff. That's another example. So we have a commitment here in the Department of Justice, but public service wide to address racism and discrimination, and inclusivity and accessibility in our hiring, not just in our practices. Um, and that's what I mean by one of those policies. You kind of just, you got to take it and use it as a sword, right? But so we developed with my executive team and consulting with staff and consulting with an advisory committee that I set up of employees, um, an HR strategy that explains how we're going to do that, how we're going to apply employment equity principles to our hiring while still supporting everybody but being transparent about it, right? Where it is on talent management, on training, on how we can hire people. So that nobody, you gotta show your work. You gotta show that your, your commitment, and then you gotta report back to them on what you've accomplished. 
Um, and that's my accountability back to staff. And in the end, that's an accountability to Canadians. We, it's incumbent on us to be representative of the people that we serve. We are stronger in our diversity. And um, can I say everybody's happy with my plan? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, do I think that their careers will suffer? No, I don't think so, because there's lots of opportunities. This is about removing the barriers for people who have been ignored and passed over mm -hmm. systematically um, for decades. So you got to get different outcomes. You got to do things differently. Boy, I've got a whole bunch of good phrases today. Anyway, <laughs> um, I hope. But that's but that's it. It's it's really about. It's more than just what the outcome is. Um, so I, I feel I feel sad when people say that I can't influence it. I influence it all the time. It's my job. It's why I'm here. It's one of the accountabilities I have, which is to like policy again, to serve in the best interest of Canadians. How am I serving the best interest of Canadians if I let a policy go forward, um, say on medical assistance and dying? that we have a new policy that impacts people um, with disabilities and we don't make sure that our online content is in simple, plain language. We don't make sure that our events aren't done in ASL and the equivalent in the French language, that we don't make sure you can listen to a recording of the changes to the law, not just read it, that we don't make sure that there isn't a braille version of that, right? Like, these are the things you need to do and uh, hard for people to say no when you put it in that context and you surround yourself with the policies that the other, I, I, I'm just using other people's ideas, figuring out how to put them into action um, and make a difference, a foundational change. With, all with the DEI lens. Absolutely, all the time. And, that, and from the beginning, it's in your goals, it's in your yeah. expectations of your team as you hire them as you promote them, the expectations are there to show that work. Yeah, and it, you know, it's not always successful. I just, um, I just ran a competitive process to hire two new directors. So those are like entry level executive positions in my organization. And I really, really wanted to um, focus on employment equity and what we call employment equity deserving groups. Um, in Canada, legislatively, those employment equity groups are women, people with disabilities, um, racialized, or we, it's still called visible minorities. Um, but there are certain people and Indigenous people. Um, but some people have been left out. And so we, it doesn't yet include um, LGBTQI plus individuals. But we expanded it in my search um, to include that. And, but my results weren't what I had hoped. Um, I had 80 applicants, and I think this is an important thing to think about because it's not just a one-off. I had over 80 applicants, it's internal to government, over 80 applicants, um, 10 of them who kind of met the criteria um, to be interviewed. Um, of those, I only had one Indigenous candidate, um, seven women, um, no one with a disability, um, and one person who belonged to the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and in the end, um, I had one Indigenous woman succeed um, in flying colors. Like, I just blew my mind. She just did an amazing job um, uh, compared to everybody else. Um, and the rest were white women like me. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it showed me is uh, we haven't done enough to grow our talent, that we haven't invested enough at mid-level communications positions to recruit more diverse individuals, um, and that we're still benefiting from second wave feminism, but we're not quite at these more senior levels we, we don't have the people yet. We have to do something different. So it means I need to go back and it, and it forced me to go and look at my own, my own cadre of people at that sort of mid-level, mid-career 
who's there? Are we doing the right investment there? And that's where that HR strategy of mine comes in place. Um, but um, there's something missing still. Like I, I hired two great people. Um, they come with great experience, but I, I'd be lying to say that I wasn't disappointed that um, it's not a more diverse group. So I got more work to do. I got yeah. more work to do. And you're yep. paying attention. Everything that you, yeah. you, you've, you've shared today is very intentional, very thoughtful yeah. from the beginning and, and holding yourself accountable. So I'm going to pause our conversation here and we're going to we're going to schedule a part two because I'd love that. I have so many more questions that you've opened up and I've gotten to know you even more than <laughs> when we you first started working together. What was that? Was it 2020? I, I, yeah, it was like the yeah. pandemic. It was, there was a it lot was the, on. it was a lot going on. There's always a lot going on though. Look what we can do. Right. Look what we can do. So yeah. Happy to talk about what more we can do. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we've bonded over just so the podcast audience understands there's, is that I have Native American heritage on my mother's side, Muscogee Nation, uh, colonizers call the tribe Creek. So you may be familiar with the, the term Creek, not to be confused with Cree out of the Canadian area, uh, <laughs> but Creek, uh, Muscogee Nation. And my grandmother is a survivor of a residential school in Oklahoma that is currently a police training facility that no one can penetrate, go visit, etc. cetera. Uh, and it changed my grandmother's life as an elementary school girl. It silenced her. Uh, mm -hmm. It did what it was intended to do. And I, as her granddaughter, missed out on all that my grandmother is and what she stood for, the stories that she had, the traditions she could have been passing down to us. We were far more proud of the heritage than she was because it was literally beaten out of her. Mm -hmm. uh, so... So S.A. and I have bonded over this work. Uh, and uh, so I follow what goes on in Canada. There's a lot of Canadian interest in DEI communications, like uh, just the amount of people that have bought our book, <laughs> the amount of clients that I've had at a Canadian level. I will be going to Toronto in the first week of June and speaking at the IABC World Conference uh, and uh, S.A., Will not be there, unfortunately, no. but it's for a very, very good reason. But there will be other um, high-level leaders from the Canadian government that I know of that will be coming, as well as other amazing uh, communicators from all over the world that are going to be coming together, learning from each other, building our networks, and building up our skills. So I'm really looking forward to meeting some of your colleagues who I know who will be attending, and you will be very missed. But we will have you back on another podcast because I have so many more questions for you and love to chat. Yeah. Thank you for all of your work. Cause what we always want people to take away is what does communicating like you give a damn look like, feel like, sound like, and I think everything you said <laughs> is basically, and here's another example. Here's another, there's no excuse. There is no excuse. No. Even when you are the justice department of Canada, the government, no excuse, no matter how regulated you are, you can't, there are things you can do. Like you said, you know, go out there with the sword. All right. So we're going to pick this up. We're going to keep talking and keep learning, keep sharing our knowledge and, and, and experience to benefit all the communicators who are listening and wanting to do this work and really step up in their organizations. And in, even in the face, because slicing through with our swords of the headwinds that tend to come our way. They're Thank always going to be there. They just, you just courage and community. That's what you need. That's a great point. It's always going to be there. So we're just going to be strategic, thoughtful, and intentional. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, let's keep taking care of each other. <laughs>